Hello and welcome to this webinar for Modern Survey. Uh, my name is Ian Bennett and I'd like to introduce you as well to Jamie Justin, who's joining me today from MISO uh, from Dotted Eyes, uh, where we're going to talk about the OS Highways network and the support for the, the network data, uh, specifically for users of Map Info, which is provided by Dotted Eyes, but other GI professionals as well. So thank you very much to Jamie for joining us today and Jamie will pick up later on in the slides. The aim of the webinar is to introduce you to the support that MISO can offer to you through their MISO portal, but also introduce them to highways and to demonstrate how you can easily replace high ITN with highways. As you may already know, ITN is going to be withdrawn this year on the 31st of March. The last update of ITN will be available in February. So the February release will be the last release of uh, ITN. If you no longer require the data, please go into OS orders and cancel your order for it and start using highways. Uh, and you should be able to move over. And hopefully, this webinar will introduce some of the translation services that are available. So what I would just want to do is set the screen with a brief overview of highways. So if you haven't heard of OS Master of Highways, hopefully this will introduce you to it. I apologize if you've heard this before, because a number of you probably by now will have done. So the start of highways is a very sim sim similar story to that of addressing, uh, whereas there's a number of different data sets in the marketplace that are being used. Local authorities had one version, Highways England had their version, and all so we had their version, which is mainly used for federal government. So working with GeoPlace and DFT, we've taken those data feeds from the Highways England and local authorities, and we pull them through in an, into an API into Ordnance Survey, where we match them to Ordnance Survey's ITN data and start to be able to merge that together and then add in the asset management and the routing information to make an, a final product. And as well as pulling third party information in there as well. And that third party information includes speed data, which we have now available. And I'm sure Jamie will come on to that later on. And there are three products that make up the family. There's the roads data, which is equivalent to the ITN road center line, plus with the streets data from the local authority gazetteers and the Highways England gazetteer. Then we have the roads data with the routing and information ma management. If you order the data, you'll see you don't need to order roads and the roads with routing and asset management. It is the same data. You'll get, you'll get duplication there. You'll get the road links, the streets and everything twice. So it's the same data, but it's got that routing information, the data that tells you when you're driving your car, where you can and cannot go, and then the asset in management information, which tells you if you want to go up and dig up your street, uh, how, uh, which local authority you need to inform you're going to dig up your street and what you need to do to reinstate the surface of the road. And then we have the path information, which is the interconnecting footpath in paths within the urban area. And so what is in these different layers? So in the roads layer, you have the road link, the road node and the ferry link, the features that were all part of our ITN plus the ferry terminals. And then from the NSG, you have the streets table. You still have a road table, which is just a list of all the road links that make up that road. So say the A1 or the M1 and all the links that make that or all, and the street relationship is very similar. We have a new feature, which is road junction. Before road junction was just a floating point. Now it's a node on the network and it gives you the junction name and number on motorways at the moment, but we are looking to expand that to cover uh, the major road network. And then we have a couple of new things in here. We have the T10 data, which is a European destination and is in the resources file, file of the data. And that's the European network. And also we have an open roads lookup. The open roads lookup we use to link highways data with the OS open roads data set. And the advantage of that is if you want to create some data against hi uh, highways, but you want to generalize it or you want to publish it and you don't want to go through, you know, the, the permission to publish route or talking to a survey about sort of copyright issues, you can take your data, take the toids and match that to open roads and then publish it on open roads. 
Then the second set down is the road to the routing asset management information. So as I say, you've got all the stuff that's in one, and then you've got the access and the turn restrictions, restrictions vehicles. So access restrictions where uh, where you've got no entries, etc., where you can't drive, or you may be restricted on driving there. Maybe only certain types of vehicles. You've got turn restrictions, you know, left turns, right turns, one ways. Then you've got hazard and structures, fords and bridges and that sort of thing. And then we've got some information that's coming out of the streets gazetteer. So I'll start at the right in the hand end because we've got the maintenance information. Who maintains that street uh, with the USRN that could be linked back through into the road link. Then you've got the reinstatement. So that's information on how you reinstate the surface of the road. And then you've got highways dedication and special designation. Special designation is the specially designated features around the maintenance highways. So times of day where you may not be able to do maintenance work. And then the highways dedication where the highways has been dedicated for a specific use, such as a bridal way or a public right away. And this is only an indication that those features exist there. It's not the full legal definition. And then finally, we have the path data, uh, very similar structure to road data. You've got the path links, you've got the paths, but as well as that in there, you've got connecting links, which will connect back to the road data. And one of the things we've done to improve this from ITN is actually snap those to the vertices on the road link. And then you've got the same data that was where it's applicable. is coming out of Gazetteer. Just very quickly to go through the relational model. And what you see on here is the road link and road node are central of the road network relational model. And they have an ID on them. Now, in OS master map uh, terminology, we always refer to as IDs as TOID. And you'll see that in some translations, the ID will be renamed as a TOID, because in the data, it will be OSGB in a 16 digit number. And you can see there the relationship to the road related area back to the topo area is referring back to a TOID. And you can see the road link then relates to the road node by using the start end node, which is on the road link. You've got forms part of, which gives you the ID of the road and the street. And then you've got the relation between the road node, the junction and the ferry, all on a TOID value or an ID. And the same with the routing asset management information. Again, this is all built around the road and the road link where the and the maintenance information is built around the street. So the ID there will be the USRN and it'll be prefixed with the USRN. So you can tell which is which. And those, so those bits work uh, are linked that way. And then you've got a link back between the street and the road link between the, the toy and we, where we've matched them. And there's a match status on there. And you can see then that the toy is, is used using link referencing to link back to the ID. I'm not going to go into all the detail of that. And if you do want more information on that, please do not hesitate to contact us. And then similar sort of model on the path uh, network model. You have the path link and the path node are separate. The path node gives you the connection to the connecting link and the connecting node which links back to the road link. And so you can start to build your walking networks or your cycling networks. And the same again, back to the ferry terminal. And you see on that, I didn't mention it previously, the ferry terminal also has a reference to the functional site site that's part of the sites layer, which you know as mass map topography layer, which is a red line around the ferry terminal, all the objects in mass map topography layer that make up that terminal. So that's a very brief sort of overview of highways. And now very pleased to welcome Jamie, uh, who is gonna take over and talk about the support that MISO from Dotted Eyes offers. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks very much, Ian. And hello, everybody, and Happy New Year. Um, so we are offering two options for handling the OS Master Map Highways Network. We're calling them routes because that seems to fit quite well with the topic of highways. And route one is about software, about being able to run something on your own machines in-house. And it's free of charge. We've released into the open source community a translator, which I'm going to talk about now. It's on a GitHub page, um, and it includes, in fact, a link to, so that you can download some sample output from it. So as well as getting the software itself, you can immediately see the output you should expect to receive by clicking that link at the bottom of the screen. Um, and 
this requires FME. We shall show you now how that works. You see their logo on the, on the page. And it requires FME desktop 2018 or above. And when you open it, this is what you see. And uh, there is a master workspace um, whose name, by the way, starts with an underscore. So it's always listed at the top of your uh, file directory. And um, it contains nothing but really a series of workspace runners that process each of the feature types in turn. There are quite a lot of those, about 30 or so. Um, and each of those workspaces that the runner operates is derived from something that OS released into the open source community a while ago, so we're crediting them for that. But we've added value on top of it. And I'll be showing you today some of the things that are done by our system, which go over and above the, the basic simple translation. Um, the next uh, thing is to show you the entire process you have to go through. We've talked about downloading the software, and here's the GitHub address. You'll be able to see this at the end uh, of the presentation as well. And then you open that workspace within FME, as I've described. You simply click the Run Translation button in the usual way. And then you're asked to specify a few translation parameters. There are only three or four of them, and they're all about pointing to the folders where you've got the input data and where you want to put the output data. And then you wait a little while. Um, this is a complex data set, and it will take a while to process. Um, if you take the free sample area from Ordnance Survey, which covers uh, a, a, an area around Exeter, it'll perhaps take around 15 minutes. It depends on the speed of your machine. Obviously, if you do national cover, it'll take a bit longer. Uh, but it just works with a single click. So when you see the translation with successful message, you will have in your output folder a whole lot of files, including a Map Info Pro workspace. This is good for version 15.2 or above. It needs to be uh, as recent as that because what we're actually outputting is a set of geo package files and the associated map info tab files that open them. There are also, uh, there's also a map info workspace file that in turn opens those tab files. So that's the final step of the process. Uh, go to map info and open one file and you'll see the whole data set. And it'll look a bit like this. This is in fact part of that sample area around Exeter. And towards the left-hand side of the map, uh, you'll, get, you'll see footpaths in pale gray running either side of the River X. So that's how you can see where you are. And you'll notice that there's different thematic coloring for the various kinds of road there. And they're all labeled as well. Uh, and you might uh, be able to see that I'm hovering the cursor in this screenshot over a road, and it's showing it as the Prince of Wales Road in the roads theme. And on the left-hand side in the Explorer window, you can see some of the tables that have been opened automatically by that map in the Pro workspace. The whole result is very similar to the ITN layer. And if you look at the top of the picture, you'll see there are two tabs for different map windows. This is the OS Highways tab, which is a lot like ITN. And the other one is the NSG Streets window which takes the data from the National Street Gazetteer, uh, collated together from all the highways authorities around uh, England and Wales, but doesn't actually include Scotland at the moment in this particular uh, That might be added by OS later. One of the things that is in this one that you wouldn't see in the uh, first tab is the locally defined C road class. So the cursor's hovering over one there that's described as C800, that's the Prince of Wales Road. Uh, a classification given by the highway authority locally and not published in the main in ITN or in the main OS um, roads data. So there we are. You open the uh, Map Info workspace and you see two map windows. There is also in the same folder um, a PDF document that goes into quite a lot of technical detail about exactly what you get. And here's just a quick look at one of the pages to show you the But now going beyond the basic network of road links and looking at some of the other output that Ian described when he was talking about the relational data model, there's a set of hazard structures. For instance. You can see in the 
uh, legend on the right hand side how they're portrayed and uh, the little box indicates some traffic calming on a particular side road there and it, it's labeled as a chain of road links we've borrowed a little trick that used to be used in itn of indicating the directions though a plus sign in there would indicate that it applies in the direction of travel of digitizing Minus sign would indicate the opposite direction, but this is a plus and minus. That means, of course, the street, uh, the traffic calming is in both directions. You also get turn restrictions. Here we can see quite a lot of them where you're banned from turning around from uh, one way street into another. There is also a ban on doing U-turns between the two legs of this dual carriageway. And here the chain of road links has three sections for a, a, a no U-turn. So the one in the direction of digitizing, two is in the opposite direction, and three is in the direction away from digitizing. But more importantly, the little red line that's overlaid on top of the road link has an arrowhead and indicates exactly what you must not do. So if you follow me, there's a blob you can hover over to see what the restriction is, and there's an arrow to indicate where it applies. And those arrows have been created by our value-added process. Um, they're all derived from data that is in the raw supply, but those little arrows are not supplied like that. And indeed, we've cut down the links just to show you what goes on at the junction and to merge them together like that. Those were turn restrictions, and these are called restrictions for vehicle technical specs. Um, it means, for example, as you can see, low bridges, so vehicles over a certain height can't go through. Here the blob is positioned actually at the point of the restriction. Uh, so the top is on a node in the network, but the bottom one is where there's a railway bridge crossing the road, and uh, it's at exactly that point. So you can use the link either side of it, but if your vehicle's over 4.5 metres tall, you'd have a bridge strike if you tried to go through. And the final kind of restriction available in the specification is an access restriction. You can see a lot of examples of them here. So these are things like no motor vehicles except for loading or unloading. And there's a time limit too. So that restriction applies in this case, if you look at the top one in the map, all year on all days, but just between 4.30 in the afternoon and 10.30 the next morning. That's taken straight from the data set. But in the data set, it's fragmented into a lot of little parts which have been assembled back together by our added value process to give you a plain English description. You can also see examples of no entry uh, and um, of uh, no vehicles at all. And there are, again, little arrows to indicate where. And in the raw data, all these blobs you can see, they're kind of mostly colored in a dark green color on your screen, um, actually occur at the junction node. They're all put on top of each other at the junction node. That makes it a bit hard to see what's going on. So another part of our added value is to disperse them slightly away from the junction on purpose. So they don't sit on top of each other and you can query them individually very easily. You can see what's there. We actually put the no turn just before the junction as you approach it in a vehicle. That's how you'd see it in real life with perhaps a no right turn sign. And we put the vehicle restrictions just after the junction. Again, more or less as you'd see it in the real world, it might say no heavy goods vehicles beyond this point. And if there's a particular mandatory turn or, or, or indeed a low bridge that occurs at the junction itself, then it'll go obviously on the node where it was originally. So that really illustrates what you get from our free open source translator. I've shown you how the files are all included in order to style the data in MapInfo Pro format. It also provides labeling and zoom layering options. And we're very much hoping that some other providers, maybe customers and other partners, might add into the open source community similar styling files for other GIS tools um, that don't come from MapInfo. And in addition, uh, you get geopackage output files. These are ready for use. I, I've shown you how they look in MapInfo Pro, provided they're opened uh, with our tab files. Um, there is a little quirk in that 
any date fields, if they're left empty of data, not populated, they can cause some software to crash and not open the file properly at all. So we've converted the, those date types into text. It shows exactly the same information, but it avoids any risk of software crashing. And I've described, as we saw in the example, how time qualifiers are put together from all the kind of elemental parts that are supplied in the data into one attribute that we call the applicable period. Then hazard structures and restrictions are moved potentially away from the nodes a little bit. A chain of road links is created using the plus, minus, plus or minus signs to show the applicable direction. And we trim back road links so that you can easily read those arrowheads uh, on the mandatory turns and on the prohibited turns. And we strategically position the symbols so that you can see what's going on. Vehicle use and load restrictions are all combined together because there's, again, a quite complex data structure in that relational model. We simply put them together so it shows exactly what vehicle types are included in a restriction and which, if any, are exemptions or except for in that restriction. We also split the street features, these are the things that come from the NSG, into named streets, and there could be each piece of geometry could have more than one name potentially. There could be a main designated name and another designated name and a local name. They all have individual um, features and they go into the name streets layer, streets named layer. Uh, in the streets numbered layer, you'll have things like the M5 uh, and the A396. Um, and this all simplifies the labeling and keeps the file sizes relatively small. And finally, um, in describing some of our added value, uh, we take the maintenance, reinstatement and special designation features, uh, which have all sorts of different geometry types in the data, and we turn them all into polygon geometry so they can all be displayed together. Perhaps most importantly for your first experience of this is that there's only a single click in FME required to kick off the entire process and it will then run right up to national cover without any further intervention. Uh, you don't have to do feature types individually. So that really was a summary of route one, our first option. Route two is a kind of upgrade part provides even more added value to the data and it's delivered as a service that we call the Highway Map Data Optimizer. What this means is that we process national cover of highways whenever it's refreshed and we can clip out from it just your area of interest and supply that to you completely ready to use in the native files of mapping or any other commonly used format, including geodatabase. This is the entire process for our service. You send us some sort of polygon which defines your area of interest, any format you like. We'll then give you a quotation in response because this is a subscription service, this second route. And if you accept that, you can download uh, from our portal the files that we've extracted specially for you. Then you get two different workspaces. In this case, if you're using Map in Pro, uh, the main one is highwaymap.wer, which perf performs a very similar function to the one I've been showing you, but we'll have a look in detail in a minute. You'll see that it's got considerably more styling finesse. And there's also another one that I'm going to talk about right at the end. And finally, you get a refresh, let's say every quarter or whatever frequency you want. It could potentially be up to every month, but uh, we found in talking to customers that every quarter seems quite a popular choice. And you, we send you an email every time there's a new set to down. So you've seen a slide for this very same area before, but this looks a bit different. Um, first of all, you can see the portrayal of the roads indicates in the styling the class of road that we're looking at. In this case, they're actually largely pedestrian only, centre of Exeter. Um, you can also see some paths coming in and the little connecting link in, that connects the path to the road. It's shown as a kind of dotted line wrapped in a casing. But more, more importantly, um, 
where we saw before just a blob, do you remember I said it was a sort of dark uh, green blob that you were seeing for the restrictions here we're using road signs or symbols that look very much like road signs so that they're quite intuitive to interpret um, and you can see on the right hand side just a snippet of the legend that explains it. and it's been auto labeled in map info pro so picking up some attribute data we've automatically placed underneath a label that shows more detail taken from the data just as you might see in the real world. For example, there's one near the bottom that says no HGVs, maximum of seven and a half tonne permissible, and the exceptions are for loading and unloading. Moving on, there are some issues about network topology in, the, in this data, because although, as Ian described, it includes paths and roads together, they aren't actually supplied in a structured way so that a routing algorithm can easily move pedestrian routes between paths and roads. So our subscription service enhances the data by splitting the road links every time the path link, link comes to connect with them. And you can see in the center of the map, I've highlighted one little part of a road link that falls between two connecting links for paths, do you see? And so this road link has been divided into a number of sections and they all clean up the topology so that a, a pedestrian routing application, for example, for routes to school or something like that, can consume the data straight away and uh, visualize what's involved. And of course, you could overlay this on top of any base map. I, I simply have kept it uh, free of clutter for the purposes of today's demonstration. Um, then, there are some other topological issues. One of them is about loops. So here's a sort of lollipop shape. It's got a little stick at the bottom and a sort of fluffy uh, top. And that fluffy top has a start node at the same location as the end node. It's a closed loop. And routing algorithms and topology uh, systems in general don't like that. They want a link to have a different start node from an end node. So if you can see where I've pointed the arrow uh, on this screen capture, um, we've clipped out a little bit, I think it's about five meters long, and that is separated from the rest of the loop. The main part of the loop retains the toyed identifier that it was given in the raw data. The little snippet we've cut out is given a different toy. And the one we give it is actually the toyed of the node there. So that if you're just concerned about links, every single link, and this applies to all the cleaning up we do, has a unique identifier, but sometimes we've borrowed it from a, a, a node at that position. One of the things we did with ITN, and some of you who've been using our tools for processing ITN will be quite familiar with this, was to draw attention to bridges by using a cartographic symbol to indicate which links go over the other links. And here you can see a case in point. There's a dual carriageway running more or less east to west and a road crossing it more or less north to south. And it's the road north to south which is carried on bridges. And the cartographic symbols we've generated make that abundantly clear. But not only visually can you, also your routing algorithm can tell that if you're on the top level of that bridge, you can't jump off onto the road below because we haven't split the link at the node on that bridge intersection. Now, this is a bit technical, but it's an important point because it's different from the raw data. In the raw data, there's no geometric difference between a crossroads with a node in the middle and a road bridge, which also has a road in the middle breaking the uh, the four links that touch it. We've prevented that problem by providing a new snippet going over the bridge, which isn't broken at the point of crossing. There's no risk of the routing algorithm jumping from top to bottom level. Now moving on to the NSG part of the data set, and you see I flicked here to the other tab in the map window, the NSG streets tab. And we're looking at the dedicated rights of use. Every time a piece of highway is legally dedicated, public highway, um, it's granted particular rights. And you can see in the legend window on the right hand side, uh, examples of some of the rights that 
to there. And if you scroll up and down, you get a complete list. And um, from the left hand uh, uh, info window, you can see that uh, the one where the cursor is hovering in the right in the middle of the map is a bridal way dedicated as a bridal way. And there are some true or false values saying this one is assumed to be a public right of way. I ought to just point out it's not definitively stated as a public right of way in the highways data. The definitive map is a separate source, but this is interpreted as being likely to be a public right of way. Uh, but it is not a national cycle route or uh, works prohibited on that section. It's not, it's not any of these other things. Different links will have different true and false values there. Now, adding to that layer, the street gazetteer, um, we can see quite a lot more information taken from the NSG. Um, and on the right hand side here, you can see that we've divided streets into the named streets, as I described earlier, versus the numbered streets, and they're styled differently. Styled in such a way that um, we're just looking at the named streets at the moment, uh, and the paths as well, which appear rather differently. Um, here, We've added special designations and asset management. Uh, and we've turned all of those things into polygons. They're kind of sausage shaped polygons that follow the shape of the road. Uh, but some of them are supplied in the data as polygons, some are supplied as lines, some as points, and quite a lot are just references to links. Here we've pulled them all together and you can see them all as polygons. And a further advantage of doing that, apart from the fact they can sit in the same layer, is that we can style them, see through fill patterns. So it's possible to see, you can maybe tell from somewhere towards the center of the map, uh, that there are some with more than one classification. And if you click on those with the info tool, you'll get all the information about things going on at that point. What you might also notice, and I've drawn attention to it in the title of this slide, is that there are differences in the geometry for some of these NSG features. Not all of them are, as it were, snapped to or matched to the OS uh, centerline. That's the difference, really, between the two tabs in the map window. The left-hand tab of OS Highways, all the geometry is consistent and follows the center line of the OS Master Map topography layer. It all fits together. On the right-hand side, it's very close, but the NSG doesn't precisely follow that convention in all cases. Only some of it is matched to master data. The rest of it, as you can perhaps tell from one or two of these lines on the slide, um, are, are really represented as straight lines. They indicate very clearly where the start and end points are of a particular special designation, but not the exact link that, 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 uh, to which it applies. Now, remember I said there were some footpaths either side of the River X. Well, snaking its way through this slide are a couple of those footpaths, and the River X is doing a sort of uh, right angle turn or meander here. So there's on the to the west of the center is a footbridge crossing the river. Actually, there are two. There's a short footbridge just above it, too. And to the right of the, or, 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 or the east of the center of the map window, is a sort of pecked blue line. This is a ferry. I know this area in Exeter, actually. And it's a rather nice little pedestrian only ferry where you hop on and the guy pulls you across by using a rope across the river. It's quite fun. This is down in the Exeter Keys area. But what I'm trying to show is that we've brought together into one network all the modes of transport that are implied in the highways network, but not actually supplied as a clean topology in that raw data. Here it is clean. It bring, brings together the paths with the roads and the ferries in a way that a routing algorithm can use. There's a further thing to draw your attention to, and that is that Really, the highways network is a 3D data set. ITN wasn't, it was just two-dimensional representation. But here, every vertex on all the path links and road links has a Z value, an elevation at the vertex. And we can use that to indicate the average gradient of each link. It's not actually expressed in the raw data from OS, but it's part of our value add in, in this. Um, and you might just be able to pick out uh, that on the north bank 
of the River X here, there are some quite steep uh, 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 embankments going up. You can see that the casing line, instead of being a dark grey, is a kind of dark red colour. And that, and the uh, where I'm hovering the cursor, you can see a flag that says the average gradient of that section of road with a slightly red casing line is between five and ten percent. So we've classified them into about four or five different bands, and that, for a cyclist like me, is quite a helpful thing to know. Again, you get a full PDF document describing in some technical detail and showing you all the uh, legend values and the appropriate styling that applies in MapInfo Pro to this service route of acquiring data. Here's just one example of a, a, a speeds page. Now, speeds is a kind of, if you like, an optional extra data set for highway networks. It's not provided as part of the PSMA contract or indeed the One Scotland Mapping Agreement, but it's available through partners such as ourselves. And our value-added uh, data optimizer service includes by default all the speeds data. And as you'd expect, it's ready styled uh, so you can use it in the same space. And here it is. Uh, this is uh, an example of how it might look. Your eye may be drawn to that little red section close to the center of the map window. That's a little private road uh, around a sort of a shopping center, and that's just five miles an hour speed limit. In, in yellow, there are some 20 miles an hour speed limits. The white ones, which are the most common probably in urban areas, are 30 miles an hour. And you can see as you get out towards the southwest corner, some 60 and even 70 miles an hour dual carriageway speed limits. In addition to the speed limits on the left hand side, you'll see we've brought together into the same table, not a separate table, the average speed supplied as part of the speeds data. Uh, there are, these apply at six different times of the week. So there's kind of a weekend speeds data and there are various you know, rush hour speeds and, and quieter times of day, six periods during the week and potentially in both directions on a road length. So that is the speed in the forward direction of digitizing and against that direction. This gives you 12 values altogether. And they're expressed in the raw data as kilometers per hour, uh, which is fine. We've actually inter kept that, but also added to it the miles per hour average speed just by applying the conversion factor so that you can easily compare that against the speed limit, which is always in miles per hour by law. Moving on, we've got uh, a layer of named highways. These are the roads and paths. And a road, just to remind you of what you saw in Ian's presentation about the relational data model, is supplied in the raw data as merely a list of links to the road, a uh, list of references to the road links. You don't actually get any geometry. You can't see it on a map. It's a list of references. But we follow those references we pick up the geometry and we meld it together into a road feature which would represent, for example, the whole of the M5 as one complex line, or the whole of Station Road in a particular town as one complex line. A great advantage of doing that, first of all, is that it's very handy for auto labeling. It means Means that you don't duplicate the name of Station Road on every single link. It just appears once for the road name. And the same with the M5. All the, the part of the M5 which is in view will have one label roughly in the center. But in addition, it reduces the data volume, which means it draws quite quickly. So as you zoom out, this is a great way to get an overview. And then as you zoom back in, more detail can appear. We've also created geometry for interchange areas. In this case, it's a motorway junction. Can you see it's labeled in the center of the map, junction 29 of the M5? And there's a sort of gray blob which picks up all of the nodes that have that property. Again, they're supplied in the raw data as a lookup list of references to the node points. But we follow those references, pick up the points, and create an envelope polygon around them. So all the motorway junctions and a lot of named junctions on major highways have a polygon like this that you can label conveniently. And it also applies to ferry terminals. 
I'm talking to you this afternoon from Southampton, where there's quite a big port, and we would provide that ferry terminal with a blob that you can label. Uh, as Ian already said, if you've got a license to the uh, OS topography layer, there's also a toy provided which lets you look up the, um, the more detailed polygon to get more precision. But this applies that you can use this with just without needing access to the topography layer. And finally, when we were testing this out, some helpful local authority customers, they were experiencing a time when they had to make a submission to DFT, something called the R199B process of validating the road lengths in various categories for DFT. Uh, and that's an important process, partly because it has a bearing on the national grant that comes from central government to the highways authorities for maintenance. Um, and so we created from the OS Highways Network um, a separate workspace in MapInfo Pro with a particular table that we call the road link category. And any of you who've been through that DFT consultation type process recognize a lot of things here. First of all, on the right hand side, we're identifying separately the rural roads from the urban roads. That's not something you get in the highways network, but we're able to add it through our service. And it does that in an intelligent way, by the way, which uh, avoids constantly chopping and changing if it weaves in and out of an urban boundary. Uh, it's smart enough to, 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 to not change the flag unless there's more than 100 meters um, outside the boundary. Uh, and on the left hand side, you can see this is actually using MapInfo Pro 17, which for a thematic map like this gives you tick boxes to turn on and off individual layers. And it was very helpful for some of our customers to be able to turn off, for example, all the links for which the highway authority doesn't have responsibility for maintenance. Those might be roads that are perhaps unadopted in residential areas, but they might also be roads that Highways England look after, such as the motorways and, uh, and trunk roads. Um, and finally, in this data set, you can see where the cursor is pointing. There's a little um, flag there that shows two separate road numbers. So, it's just a little part of a junction. It's kind of where a side road crosses dual carriageway of a main road. And OS has given that the uh, value of the crossing road, B3183, but the NSG has it as a junction on the main road, the A3015. And so in a borderline case, for example, between a C-class road and a B-class road, it might be important to know that distinction. So we've picked up both the values. We're showing the NSG one always in square brackets. And we've done that by a spatial join between the road link feature and the NSG feature. So I expect you get the picture that there's really quite a lot of work being done before we issue this data set to you as part of your regular refresh that should save you a lot of time in using it. And finally, I bet you've never seen a map. I'd never seen a map quite like this before, but it is the representation of the 10T network, the European concept of the Trans-European Network for Transport. And it's got um, in purple, the comprehensive, no, sorry, I should really start with the green ones. That's the main corridor, the kind of artery of the Trans-European Network green. Then the blue ones add to that core roads that importantly lead to different ports usually so you can get over to Ireland or back to the mainland of Europe um, from one of those ports and comprehensive uh, 10T network adds other important uh, roads in purple and then you might just be able to see some red and orange ones they're quite short lengths they're described in the specification as the last mile uh, which is actually not to be interpreted literally in terms of distance but it's a, it's a very good shorthand way of saying the connecting bits at the end of the network to important locations are there. Now, what you get with the highways network is a CSV file. And actually, it's not even in the data folder. It's in a resources folder. You get a CSV file listing all the toys that make up this 10T network. But you can't really visualize what's going on. Here, we've done it for you. Again, the principle is we followed the 
geometry and then styled it in such a way as to make it useful. So, in summary, the further added value that our service gives you, our route to option, over and above what we do in the free open source translator, is that we've reformulated the OS Highways network data, combining certain feature types, but also dividing others to make it easier to come to terms with. The output in this case is not in geo package files, it's in native format either map info tab files or if you like geodatabase files or something of that sort this makes it load faster in your application and ensures the best possible compatibility with software for example our tab files will work with all sorts of versions of map info pro they fit within the two gigabyte file size limit even for national cover by the way that limit also applies to shape files and all our output fits into that the network is fully cleaned and topologically structured, making it suitable for all kinds of routing, including pedestrians and using ferries as well if required. As is usual with dotted eyes data supply, we've added a legend column. This is derived from multiple attributes in the raw data, and it puts together a nice plain English description of exactly what each feature is. And it enables us to use sophisticated styles. I've been able to show you some of those as we go along, including absolutely tons of custom symbols that you get supplied with the data, which resemble road signs. And we make those little bridge symbols just as we did with ITM to indicate visually where there's an upper level that you can't jump to the lower. We combine road numbers and names, so we might you might see something like B396 High Street, all as one attribute name, which makes it easy to do auto labeling. But we could also abbreviate that because there seems to be a sort of law of nature that the shorter the road link, the longer its name. I don't know why that is. Um, so we abbreviate using the same sort of thing you might see in, for example, an A to Z, if I'm allowed to say that. Um, so street becomes ST, road becomes RD, and all sorts of abbreviations are commonly used. I've described how we meld the lists into geometry for named highways and for interchange area features. You've seen the example of OS Open Roads, which might be useful for exercises like R199B and any other consultations with DFT. And we've been able to bring to life mysterious European 10T classifications. You can see road link gradients, that's the average gradient on a link, categorized into five different values. And the value added service that we call the Highway Map Data Optimizer includes as standard both speed limits and average speeds. Uh, the, the fee you pay us includes the license that we pass on to OS and their other suppliers uh, for all that speeds data. And finally, we've introduced the urban and rural categories and got an intelligent way to avoid the problem of chopping them into tiny little bits of spaghetti that, as they weave in and out of the uh, urban areas. And it's interesting that we've added the speed limit to that because there's quite a good correlation between urban areas and a speed limit of 30 miles an hour or less. So that's a good useful check on the categories. So with that, I'll hand back, if I may, to you, Ian, so you can summarise what we've seen. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was very interesting, and I hope everybody else found that it's equally interesting. If you've got any questions, please feel free to start sending them in. Uh, and as James has said, hopefully that's given you an overview of highways and the way in which uh, MISO support that and the different types of support available and what is available to you, especially if you're using MapInfo. There is further information available. Uh, Karen has asked whether the, the webinar will be available after the session. Yes, we are recording it and it will be available and we can make the slides available as well. Um, by means, share that with other members of staff. And we'd also, if you want to have a conversation as well, please don't hesitate to contact either Jamie or myself. My email is ian.bennett at os.uk. Uh, so we have a dedicated web page for ITN to Highways Migration where you've got the links to various information. It's 
specifications. This is what we've called the playbook, which gives you various ideas of what you can do with the data. And then the other webinars are on there. And at the bottom of that page, you can see there's a link there to the GitHub page to the MISO portal where their translators are available. And you can go on there and download their, uh, those from there. And our translators are also available from the, the ITN page as well, the migration page, and look at those.